before I hit record, I ate my body weight in pineapple, which was a terrible move on my part, so I can't feel my mouth. April 2021 started out as a month of Argentinian literature. Then it turned into a month of Japanese literature, and I read three Japanese books. Four, if you count a book by a Japanese to English translator about Japan, which I've already done a video on, but you probably don't. So here's two, and a third one that I read on my Kindle. Picture it. You can't, I haven't told you what it is yet. So I have three books that are all new Japanese books in translation that have come out in April 2021 that I want to talk about. One is a YA fantasy-ish Murakami-esque kind of a novel. One is a very, very punk and angry short story collection that has a speculative sci-fi kind of an edge to it. And the third is a romance novel that leans into more traditional romance novels like Jane Eyre and Pride and Prejudice, that kind of thing. Let's go. This is The Lonely Castle in the Mirror by Mizuki Tsujimura. It was translated by Philip Gabriel, who translates a lot of Murakami stuff. He is most famously known for being a Murakami translator, and he's really good at his job, so that's a good start. I first heard about this book at the start of the year, and I immediately put it at the top of my most anticipated Japanese books of 2021 list, and my anticipated books in general of this year list. I have now read it, and it's good. It's not as good as I hoped it would be, but for whatever reason, I just put my head in the clouds with this one a little bit. I read the blurb, I looked at the cover, I saw how successful it was in Japan, and I thought, yep, this is my cup of tea. It's a fantasy-ish kind of a story, it's Murakami-esque, and I had really high hopes for it. It's kind of a YA urban fantasy-esque story about school, life, belonging, bullying, independence, trying to be yourself. It's a book that really speaks to a young Japanese audience, or a young audience in general. But what's it about? Lonely Castle in the Mirror begins with a girl. She is in middle school, I think, and her name is Kokoro, which in Japanese means heart. She's had a really rough time recently at school. She encountered a very, very traumatizing issue. It involved another girl who bullied her, I guess. I don't want to go into it because I suppose it could be considered spoilers, but Kokoro was effectively bullied into a fear of going to school, and so the book begins with her mum trying to put her in a different school. But Kokoro keeps coming up with excuses, mostly having a stomach ache. She doesn't want to go to school. And suddenly, one day, early in the book, she is sucked into her bedroom mirror. It starts glowing, she passes through it, and she's in a very European fairy tale esque castle, the Lonely Castle in the Mirror. There, she meets six other kids roughly her age. They're all teenagers, and they are greeted by this girl on the cover. She's known as the Wolf Queen, and she is a young girl wearing a wolf mask. We do not see her face, and she's wearing this kind of pretty tea dress thing. And she tells them that they have until next March. I think the book begins in August, and they have until March, so about six months, to find a key that is somewhere in the castle. When they find the key, it will open a room, and the room will grant them a wish. Only one of them can have their wish granted, and if one of them opts to have their wish granted, they will all lose all of their memories of their time spent in the castle for the next six months. If no one gets their wish granted, the castle still shuts down, but they all get to remember their time in the castle. And if someone breaks a rule, there are certain rules about when the castle is open and closed, it's only really open from, I think it's nine to five, then they get eaten. That's the threat. A wolf will literally come and eat them if they break certain rules about the castle. Then the book slows down. For most of the book, it is a story of these seven kids spending their time in the castle. They figure out that something they all have in common is that none of them are currently at school. They are all skipping school, they all have their own unique reasons for not wanting to go to school, and so they're spending their time in the castle. They start playing video games together. The castle has no running water, but it does have electricity, and they start playing video games and leaving their consoles behind, and they use it as kind of like a, a treehouse of sorts, where they all meet up and play video games and get to know each other. 
What's interesting about it is that they really fail to get to know each other despite spending more and more time together in the castle, because they keep finding out things about each other. This book is full of twists, and those twists never would have been twists if the kids had just communicated better. They're really bad at communicating with each other. That is part of the themes of the book, but it's also a little bit frustrating. It's a really chill book. It's not as fantastical as I thought it would be. I thought it was going to be really, really dark and twisted, and that it was going to feel like a race to the finish, them trying to get the key, get their wish. And actually, no, they just kind of hang out a lot of the time, while also going back home to the real world and facing their problems. Or not. It's a really sweet book. It's a lovely YA tale. It has very, very clear themes and morals, especially when you get to the end of the book. There is a massive twist moment at the very, very end that actually made me like the book even more. As the book went on, because it has a very slow, meandering pace, I was starting to lose interest a little bit, but the very last few pages actually reveal something that is so sweet and lovely and heartening that it changed my whole perspective on the book and made me appreciate it a lot more. Overall, it's a really lovely tale. It's well translated. The only issue I have with Philip Gabriel's translation is that there are a few moments where the translation is kind of awkward, where he encounters something that's difficult to translate from Japanese, and so he kind of translates it in a stumbly kind of way where he gives you the Japanese and then kind of explains why it's a pun or whatever. And this happens a lot with translation and some translators handle it well and some don't. I don't think he handled it that well. And I thought it was a bit of a weird choice. Given how many of his translated works I have read, I know that he's better than this. But at the same time, he's really good at translating these characters and their dialogue. They're really fleshed out and brought to life and their dialogue sets them apart as unique characters and he instills into them a lot of unique unique voices, so yeah, well done him. I think it's a lovely YA story. It's about 300 pages, it's a good length, uh, it's a very modern fairy tale in a lot of ways. It has very clear morals and themes, it has a few twists and turns, young protagonists, and a lot of themes and story beats that revolve around bullying and friendship. That's kind of what it's going for. And I think it makes for a really good YA story, or children's story, or story for adults who like fairy tales and children's tales and stuff. It's good. Get it? Next up is this. This is something very, very different and very, very exciting. This is a short story collection by Izumi Suzuki. It's the first thing that we've had from her in English, which makes it very, very exciting and also a little intimidating. Izumi Suzuki was an incredible person. She was born shortly after World War II. She lived until the 80s, and she had a really strange and fascinating career. She worked as a hostess, she worked as a nude model, and she worked as an actor. She worked in what they call the pink film industry, which is films that have sexual or naked elements to them. She only did that for a little while, and then eventually she was a writer. Uh, she wrote plays, novels, and short stories. And this is a collection of seven of her stories, and every single one of them is fascinating. She was a very punk person, doing daring and strange things. And she had a child with a famous saxophonist who they divorced, and then he accidentally died shortly afterwards. And after she wrote the titular story of this collection, Terminal Boredom, she hanged herself at home. Her health was deteriorating, and I think she was struggling to raise her child by herself. I'm not sure on that bit. But yeah, she was 37 years old, and she committed suicide. And what we have now is this collection of speculative science fiction. That's what I'm going to call it. These stories are all translated by different translators. There are seven stories and six translators. One of them is Polly Barton, whose book 50 Sounds came out recently and I did a video on it. Uh, two of the other translators were Sam Bett and David Boyd, who worked together translating Mieko Kawakami's books, Breasts and Eggs and Heaven, which is coming out soon. I'll be doing a video on that as well. It's a really nice collection of translators. Every single one of them is as good as the other. This is a perfectly solidly translated collection of tales that does Suzuki justice. The stories themselves are all science fiction in a way. Not heavily science fiction, but speculative, political. They have some sort of a, a bent to them. The first story, for example, I can't remember what it's called now, I think it's called Women and Women. Yeah, the first story is called Women and Women. It tells the story of a world where originally 
all of the human race was just women. And then suddenly a woman gave birth to a man and men became part of the human race. And then they dominated the human race and patriarchy set in and the world looked the way it does now. And it was men who invented things and men who conquered things and men who became kings and leaders. And then slowly, in a kind of Planet of the Apes way, men started to die out. Pollution is blamed. And men start living in these kind of communes. And the world is once again predominantly run by women. And our protagonist is just a modern woman who one day sees a man walking outside of her bedroom window and thinks that's impossible. There aren't many men left and they all live in these communes. And she starts a relationship with this man of a sort. I won't tell you any more. But it's a really fascinating tale. It's kind of an angry story, and it looks at patriarchy. It looks at what the state of the world would look like if it was run by women, to an extent. Or at least maybe her vision. I won't go through all of them, but the second story, You May Dream, is a particularly strange one. And it tells the story of the, the world is overpopulated. And so there's been this kind of government-led push to get people to cryogenically freeze themselves while things get fixed. So you get put in a cryogenic chamber and you'll get unfrozen when things are okay again. That's kind of the idea. But a lot of people assume that this is basically a death sentence. They freeze you and they probably won't unfreeze you and maybe you won't even survive. It's not entirely clear, but there is cynicism surrounding it. Our protagonist has a friend who she doesn't really like. She gets annoyed by her. They don't really have anything in common and somehow they've been friends for a long time. And the friend wants to get frozen but there's this interesting thing where the frozen person can choose a friend or a family member to kind of put their consciousness into, share their brain, but only for a time, and they only appear while that person is dreaming, and they just kind of pop up in your dreams. So our protagonist is the one that her friend chooses. Friend gets frozen, friend starts popping up in protagonist's dreams, and just continues to kind of annoy her just as much as she did when she was a separate person. Interesting premise. The stories are quite often quite amusing. There are a lot of funny elements in a kind of black comedy way or a cynical kind of comedy, very bleak, straight-faced kind of comedy. But it's usually the premise that hooks you. The premises are quite often about global issues, as a lot of science fiction is, most science fiction, about global issues, taking them to their extreme, looking at where they might lead, where they could lead, looking at them from a cynical lens. There is a really punk attitude to this book because the stories are quite often angry and they do look at these social issues of a sexual, gender-related, political nature. I adored it. It was everything I thought and hoped it was going to be, and more. Because I knew that these were kind of punk, angry, feminist to a degree stories. But I'd forgotten that they were also science fiction stories, and I love science fiction, so I was really, really hooked. These stories are fantastic. They're pretty varied, although the themes do dance around each other. You can kind of predict after a while. There's a lot of um, overpopulation in these tales. That's a recurring theme and its approach from different angles. I think three different stories deal with population growth in some way. But I loved it. I really did. And this is a very special book because, as I said, this is Izumi Suzuki's only collection of stories in English translation. This is what we have of her in the English world. And she was a truly special person, a special writer, an incredible visionary of the 20th century, Japanese avant-garde women's literature. So please pick this up. It's published by Verso Books, who do so much cool shit, so give it a read. The third and final thing that I read is on my Kindle, so I can't show you the cover, but here it is. Editing. <laughs> it's a novel by Keiichiro Hirano, who wrote a book that came out in English translation last year called A Man. I didn't read that. This is At the End of the Matinee. The first thing that got me really excited about At the End of the Matinee is the fact that it's translated by Juliet Winters Carpenter, who has quickly become a favourite translator of mine. She translated Kobo Abe's Secret Rendezvous, which is my favourite Kobo Abe book. I wrote an article all about his books, the ones that I read recently. You can go read that, I'll link it below. And she also translated An Eye Novel by Minae Mizumura, which I did a video on recently. That was one hell of a, well, eye novel, a piece of autofiction that I really adored. You can go watch my video, I won't talk about it here, but Carpenter is an incredible translator. She does amazing things with her translation, and for her to translate at the end of the matinee is really exciting. And it's a really lovely book. It's also lovely to see a romance novel written by a man. You don't see that a lot. 
And this is a romance novel that, as it went on, when I kind of got to the halfway point, I realised how Jane Austen slash Jane Eyre it is. It's a very classical book. It's written in the modern day, but it had a very classical English romance kind of a bent to it. It tells the story of two people. One is a classical guitarist from Japan. The other is a half Japanese, half Croatian woman. The two of them are around the age of 40. He's 39 and keeps talking about how he's turning 40 soon, and she's already about 41. She's a journalist and a pretty prolific one. She's based in Paris, and early on in the book, she has to go to Iraq, because this is set around 2005, 2006, during the Iraq war, and she's gone there to cover it for a Parisian newspaper. She speaks English, French, and Japanese. Her mother is from Nagasaki, and the two of them meet at the beginning of the book at one of his concerts. He's a really prolific classical guitarist with a bunch of albums out, and he's really beloved internationally. He's toured the whole world, awards, performances, blah blah blah. So the two of them are really successful, fascinating, interesting people, and they meet after one of his performances. And they're talking, and they get to know each other, and the sparks are flying. The two of them are so obsessed with each other, they are fascinated by the other, they admire each other for so many reasons. He finds out that her father is a famous Czech filmmaker, and one of his films inspired our guitarist protagonist to pick up the guitar when he was a child. Really, really detailed character backstories that we get, and they're always fascinating. These characters, their families, their backgrounds, their childhoods, they're really fleshed out, and we get a lot more detail about them as the book goes on, and they're constantly interesting. What makes the book so enticing all the way through is the fact that they have a very will-they-won't-they they kind of relationship. They travel the world, both of them, they have to travel for their jobs, and they're always kind of meeting and then swerving away from each other. She's engaged to this guy. I think he's American. Yeah, he's an American guy and they live in Paris. They've known each other for years. She's engaged. But our guitarist kind of doesn't want to take no for an answer and he just can't stop thinking about her and can't stop meeting her and she is messing up his music. You know, he can't focus. It's that kind of troubled artist story. He can't eat or sleep without thinking about her. And she's feeling the same way, but obviously she's more torn because of her situation. And when she goes to Iraq, and again, this is really early in the book, I'm not spoiling anything. She goes to Iraq, she almost dies from a suicide bombing in a hotel that she narrowly escaped. And now she has, I don't think they call it PTSD, but she has trauma that she's trying to work through and a kind of survivor's guilt. It's a really, really delightful book. It's been framed as an adult romance, but most romance is adult. I think that's the case because the romance is important, but the characters themselves and their stories as individuals and as a pair, they're, they're kind of given equal weight. You know, their, their jobs and their childhoods, their backstories, everything, it's all kind of measured. You know, the romance isn't the only thing, there is more going on. It's a little bit dry in places, despite it being so detailed and having these curveballs thrown at you constantly. There are always things getting in the way, and at the halfway point, uh, a spanner is thrown into the works that is genuinely frustrating because we've seen it before in romantic comedies, in sitcoms, we've seen this kind of spanner get thrown into the works in romance stories before, so it was a little annoying seeing it. I was like, it was a miscommunication thing. I was like, oh, this has been done too many times. Where was I? Yeah, it, so it, it, despite all of that excitement, it still feels a little bit dry in places. It's very chill, despite, you know, terror attacks, PTSD, and traveling the world and really fascinating characters, it still comes across a little bit dry. I can't put my finger on why, but it is. I still think it's a worthwhile read, don't get me wrong, and it's nice to read a romance novel that has that kind of an atmosphere and attitude. It's a very worthwhile read, and I like the fact that both characters are given equal attention, they are both given perspectives, it's all in the third person, but we do move from one perspective to the other throughout the book, and I really appreciated that. I thought it would, they were really both well fleshed out fascinating people. It's not perfect, and I think that the depictions of Iraq, Hirano really tries to do a good job of not being Islamophobic in any way. Some people might argue that he doesn't succeed. I'm not really one to make that call, but I do think that it was nice seeing a Japanese novel that is so international and so big and uh, ambitious, and to have you know one protagonist be mixed race, multicultured, multilingual, that kind of thing, uh, really really impressive. So yeah, I would say that this is a very unique book, one of the more unique Japanese novels I've read recently, and very much worth your time. All right, those are the three. I have read all three of these 
Japanese books recently, and I adored all three of them in their own way. I think that this one, Terminal Boredom, is flawless, and the other two have a few problems, but are still worth picking up. They are three of my most anticipated Japanese books of this year. They all came out in one go, and they are all worth reading, and I really hope you pick up at least one of them. If you do only have time or money for one, make it Terminal Boredom, but maybe you prefer YA, fantasy, romance, castles, whatever. It's your call. But Terminal Boredom is special. All right. Have a good time. <laughs> Subscribe for books and join our Patreon. All right, bye.